Hey everybody, I'm Carson the Magic Pickle, and odds are you haven't seen my videos before, but if you have, you would know that I only play video games with my friends. I don't make videos involving any kind of drama or getting in on like the latest fad or current thing, but I saw a video on YouTube when I was browsing by the name of Elden Ring has a lot of problems. It's by a, a small YouTuber just like me named Silverboy, and I was prompted to make a response video after watching it because I felt like he wasn't really doing the game a lot of justice. And he's allowed to have his opinions about the game. I'm not saying that he can't. This isn't meant to be some kind of hate video or something like that. But basically I just wanted to respond to points that I felt were unfair to the game, uh, lacking in truth, or lacking in really substance. So yeah, you'll see what I'm talking about as we get further into the video, so stick around. Um, but yeah, that's basically it. No hate. No nothing, just my response. And really, the game doesn't even need me to defend it. I mean, just taking a look at his comments alone, I mean, none of them are very positive. Most of them are just saying he's bad at the game and stuff, but, you know, that's not what I'm here to do. I'm just here to go point by point. Okay, let's start. One of the first points he makes is that Elden Ring is a horse simulator like many other open world games. Okay, let's begin. The first thing I want to talk about is this game's open world. This world visually is very beautiful and has some amazing views, but there is a small problem about that. Most of the time you will ride your horse and try hard in order to find the content. Yeah, I know that every single open world game is a horse riding simulation world, and it I makes this game worse. If we remove all swamp and boring locations and just leave all main locations, this game would be much, much better because this open world and I want to take it seriously is literally a huge empty world so i disagree with the sentiment that the world feels empty because in all actuality that doesn't seem to reign true at all i mean look at literally every main area it's always bustling with life there's always a a quest to do there's always an npc to talk to there's always crafting materials upgrade materials there's always a dungeon to go explore a boss to fight i mean there's just so much content literally everywhere i mean one of the uh, examples he brings up of being empty is the catacombs and dungeons, feeling a lot of samey and cut and paste content. Call it whatever you like. And also, dungeons in this game are literally the same. Either a small dungeon, a dungeon in which there is a big chariot, and three floor caves. And sure, sure, that, that is a valid criticism. A lot of the catacombs are copy and paste. Uh, reused assets, kind of, except like with minor twists. But look at the Black Knife Catacombs, for example. I mean, that's one of the worst ones in the game. I mean, you have to climb up a random guillotine so you can make your way to an illusory wall to find an item for Rogier's quest. It's so easy to miss. That's one of the worst dungeons in the entire game. But even then, it's not empty because you have two bosses to fight there, you have a key item to get, a quest item, and then you, you're you progressing a quest. How is that empty? The only empty place I can think of in the entire game is the Lake of Rot. And that is universally panned. Nobody likes the Lake of Rot except me. I love poison swamps. I am I think I'm alone in that boat. But at the end of the day, that's only one character's quest line. You don't need to go to the Lake of Rot unless you're doing Ronnie's quest. There's literally nothing to do there except Ronnie's quest. Though, to be fair, it is one of the most important quests in the game if you want the quote-unquote best ending, so there is technically a reason to go there, even though it's not mandatory. This next point I actually kind of agree with. Key items and locations are too hard to find in this game. And I want to show you one very funny thing. Humans are a very strange creations. If you show them something like this, they will lose their mind and scream, eh, eh, shit again, shit again, eh. But if you show them something like this, they will scream, oh my god, 10 out of 10 game, what a masterpiece. Despite the fact that 90% of the time, they use YouTube tutorials in order to find a right way or to at least find any key item. And that can be true for a lot of things. Sometimes a key quest item for your favorite NPC's quest are impossible to find locking you out of progression. Sometimes you accidentally progress the NPC's quest too far by getting a certain item. Sometimes finding where they even go next is borderline impossible. Finding out where locations are in this game is almost impossible. So let's get some examples. Let's see what he goes through. Answer one question, and I want you to answer it without lies. How many of you managed on your own to find a road to Malenia without YouTube tutorials? Number one, he gives the Halig tree, and that is absolutely true. Most fresh installs, people new to Souls games won't even find the Halig tree. I didn't find it. My first, second, maybe even third playthrough. 
I was looking for Latena the entire time. I couldn't find her. I couldn't find the stupid cave that leads to her hiding spot where she is pretty much dead with her dog. So I I couldn't find it. And I agree. Halleck Tree is too hard to find. No, how many of you managed to find all bell bearings for smithing stone? Next up is the smithing stone bell bearings. And yeah, I didn't find them all my first playthrough either. Second, I think I did, but I can't remember that far back. And, but I found more than enough to get me through the game at least once or twice before I learned the rest of their positions from the wiki. So, yeah, I'll give you that one. The, finding all of the pieces to a match set like that that doesn't tell you where the other half is, sure, I'll give you that. Next up, though, we have... No, 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 I have a better one. How many of you managed to find both Dectus medallions? You might say, well... The Dectus medallions. Yeah, I, I, I'm not with you on that one, Chief. So each half of the Dectus Medallion tells you in text in the description where the other half is. If we take a look at the left half here, in the description it says, The right half is said to reside in Fort Ferreth in the Dragon Barrow far to the east. Okay, where is it? Fort Ferreth. Where is that? In the Dragon Barrow. Where is that? Far to the east. Three minutes and you know where it is. So let's say you don't find the left half first. Let's say you don't go to Fort Height. Let's say you accidentally uh, go speak to D and go to Garok's house before you start heading down to Fort uh, Fort Ferreth. You get in there and then you're like, whoa, Dectus Medallion right? Where is that? Where's the left half? So you read the description. The left half is said to reside in the coastal Fort Height, far to the west. Instead, it's sure this is a little bit uh, confusing. Since it's not far to the west, it's just, you know, more west than you are now. But it still tells you where it is. Fort Height. If you talk to Kenneth before this, you'll know where it is. So unless you somehow get the right medallion first on your first playthrough, there's no reason you shouldn't know where the other one is. And even then, you should pretty much know where the other one is. And the next one he gave was even more baffling. The Glintstone Academy Key. Okay, that's a completely different story. So, okay, let, let, let's put yourself in the shoes of a fresh install for a minute. Let's say that you have spent 15 hours beating Godric. Right? Godric. Not, not Godfrey, Godric. That's pretty generous for a new player. Somebody new to Souls games who just spend their time uh, walking around fields, looking for items, talking to people... Uh, failing at bosses, coming back, trying again. Let's say 15 hours to beat Godric. Let's say you walk out of the back of his castle and you start your journey into Lyernia. Let's even say, for some reason, you ignore the church with Thops in it, literally right next to the castle you just came out of. Let's say you ignore it and you run past it so you never even hear of an academy key, ever. You follow the path and you go through the forest in front of you, and finally, in the distance, you see this magic castle on this huge hill. These giant pillars of rocks. So, you walk up, and you grab the grace at the front. Uh-oh, this door won't open. It says it's bound by a seal. Well, at least there's this item to my left on this dead body. Meeting place map. Now, let's assume you don't read the description of this map, right? Let's say you don't read it. Even though it very clearly says, The man it came from surely desired one. The sole means of gaining entry to the academy. A glintstone key. Let's say you don't read that sentence. You look at the map, and you're like, Oh, hey, that's pretty close to me. I should go there. So, you start heading there. Oh, a dragon. He's guarding some items. Oh, the key. I can get in now. That's how long it should take. That is how long it should take. But let's assume you do read it, and then you immediately know where the key is. That took you less than 10 seconds, because the map telling you where to go is literally right next to the door. Right next to the door. I left a comment on his video explaining why it shouldn't take a new player that long to find it. And he said, well, how long did it take you? Five to six hours? And I said, no, it should take a new player maybe about three minutes to know where all three of these items are. And okay, okay, okay. Maybe those were just bad examples, sure. But that's what I'm talking about, where half of his 
arguments have no substance or lack some truth. Because the Dectus Medallion and the Glenstone Key are awful examples of things being hard to find in the game. Some things are in outright sinister hiding places. There's no doubt about that. But if you are paying attention, a lot of things can be found very easily. The estimation for the times these things take should not be five to six hours. Some of these things are minutes, max, seconds even. The next point he makes is about the crafting system in the game. He calls it inherently useless, and I disagree with that, but to begin... The right path. Also, in this game, we have a bit to craft items, and ironically, what you crafted in this game? Personally, I only crafted golden chicken legs. He claims that it should be replaced by just having everything be purchasable from the Twin Maiden Huss. If it can be crafted, boom, store, at the round table. And I think that's a terrible, terrible idea. The way I see it, there are two implementations. Either you can buy everything from the very start of the game, whatever item you want, blood boil aromatic, iron jar aromatic, uh, uh, rot pots, anything, just from the very beginning of the game, or you have to kill an enemy and or, or, or a boss or complete a quest or something and get a bell bearing to bring back to the table so you can actually purchase these items. And either way, I think that's a terrible, terrible idea because... How does that make the game feel more full? If the main argument against the game is that the world feels empty, how does removing any incentive to go anywhere but the main path really benefit the game? How does that make it feel more full? In fact, removing everything from the game and just putting it all in one spot would make 90% of the world feel even more empty as a result. It just doesn't make sense to me. And it's not like the crafting system is an inherently useless system either. He claims that the only Thing that he ever crafted throughout his journeys were the golden chicken fowl feet and those are useful getting extra runes just for popping a little item just like that is inherently valuable no matter what you're doing if you're grinding if you're uh, killing bosses getting an extra little bit of money is always helpful for trying to uh, level up weapons level up your character whatever but that's all you crafted if that was all that was craftable, I would say, yeah, just give it to the Twin Maiden Hus. But that's not all that's craftable. And everything else can be used. Let's start with the weakest argument here, bows. For bows, you can craft rot arrows, you can craft poison arrows, blood arrows, magic arrows, literally any kind of arrow or bolt you can plug in and just boom, a bunch, as long as you kill a bunch of dogs. If that was it, I would say, yeah, just give that all to the Twin Maiden Hus. But think about anything else you would ever want to use. You need to do more damage? Exalted Flesh. Blood Boil Aromatic. Iron Jar Aromatic for more poise. You need a certain kind of pot to help you with the battle you're doing? Okay, what kind of battle is it? Is it Death Rite Bird? Holy Pot. If it's a Godskin Duo? Sleep Pot. Anything that can be slept? Sleep Pot. Anything where you just need a little bit of extra damage? Just give them a little bit of, you know, one, two with the Rot Pots, with the Poison Pots, literally everything. There are so many useful pots. You're going out after an Erd Tree avatar, fire pots, boom. You need to take a little less damage, fried liver of your choice. You need to get rid of a certain of status effect, bolluses. There's so many things that are useful in this game. You're just not using them. You need to get down from a ledge, boom, rainbow stones. You're doing PvP, I mean, all the stuff I just mentioned, plus warming stones so you don't have to use your, your flasks. Pickled turtleneck for extra stamina recovery. No matter what you choose to craft or not craft, it doesn't make anything you don't craft useless. Somebody else may find a point to it that you haven't yet. To me, it sounds like you're underutilizing a resource, especially with the next problem that you complain about. This next point is a little bit iffy, and it's a bit of a long one. This is absolutely fair. So let's talk about gameplay. First of all, weapons. On this playthrough, I purposely started as a knight because I wanted to see if it's possible to beat this game with my Dark Souls style playthrough. For me, it's middle weight armor, middle or huge shield, and a straight sword. In the beginning, I changed my shield with another sword, and I even liked this build. But as soon as I killed Morgoth, I realized that this build sucks ass. Because bosses after Morgoth not only are extremely tanky, they are also very fast and do a reasonable amount of damage. And because of 
plot, your only way to kill bosses in late game is a will of bloodlust and freeze katanas or a super OP Age of War. I know that very few laugh at people who use reverse of blood or bloodlust katanas, but sorry, what other choice do they have? You either die to the same boss over and over because you do a very low amount of damage or you just take katanas and remove this boss face from this game. Ashes of War are too OP and the game is too hard to play or even beat without them. He gives the example of a typical knight with a standard shield and a straight sword not being good enough. Basically, the Vagabond class has this trusty shield, this big straight sword ready to go into any fight you give him. He's just all around a good, good character design in all Dark Souls games. But he argues that in this game, that is not the case. And I agree, some of the Ashes of War are great, and I'll get into that later. But I find very few in the game... As of the time of recording this video and it going up, which is going to be about a week or two after his goes up, I fail to find very many that are overtuned to the extent Silver Boy really claims. Some are better than others, yeah. Some of the Ashes of War, which are, are combos or heavy attacks, cost some of your mana bar and are going to be a lot better than these light attacks or heavy attacks from a single-handed normal straight sword. And that just stands to reason. Because think about this. Does it not stand that this... should do more damage than this? But on top of that, attacking with a straight sword instead of the Ashes of War doesn't feel like an unfair trade-off. It doesn't feel like you're missing out by not using the Ash of War, like you're handicapping yourself. Because think about what a straight sword offers. It offers a reliable, fast, and safe attack. If you play it right, you can get in and out before a boss can really do anything. Most bosses in the game. Some of them are too fast. I agree. Malaketh, that one is just a completely difficult boss. That one even feels unfair sometimes. But excluding that one outlier... Most of the time in the game, the straight sword is going to feel fair to use. And that's why your damage is going to be a lot lower, is because it's faster and safer. Doing a light attack with the straight sword, even a heavy attack with the straight sword, committing to a big heavy attack, shouldn't do more damage than a lot of these very hard to get quest requiring weapons. Like, think about the Dark Moon Great Sword you get from Ronnie's quest. You have to literally complete like half of the game at least and complete her whole quest line to get that sword and it's pretty good it is pretty good but should it do more damage than the sword you start with yeah i think so and even if you didn't want it to do more damage why don't you buff it you can just use all these buffs you have in the game think about golden vow you get that literally in limgrave if you just head north towards the big aqueduct-looking pillars, you can find a, a, a knight that has the Golden Vow Ash of War. And given that is worse than the incantation, but you can just get the incantation later. Because the incantation stacks with Flame Grammy Strength. So does the Ash of War, by the way. But the, the incantation is just so much better. It's just an all-around better version of it. Golden Vow and Flame Grammy Strength together provide a 38% damage boost because it's multiplicative. So instead of 15% and 20%, instead of just getting 20% because it's higher, you get them both for 38% more damage just for casting two spells before you go into the game. And even then, there are so much more buffs you can use. Craft a Blood Boil Aromatic for extra damage. Craft an Exalted Flesh. If you have a magic build, use Terra Magica. If you have that, at least. Use the crack tiers from your physic to do more damage. There's the opaline bubble tier. Use talismans that complement your build. There are There's a, a talisman in the game that does more blood damage. Makes you do more damage in everything if you just hit a blood proc. It is so easy to boost your damage in this game. And there are so many ways to do it that a YouTuber named Bushy made a video showcasing all of them stacking together. <laughs> He was able to literally one-shot almost every boss in the game with the amount of damage he was doing. So, damage is really not the problem here. Damage buffs are not hard to come by. So tanky enemies shouldn't be a problem. 
Think about, and again, Golden Vow, literally in Limgrave. Flame grant me strength. You don't even have to go do anything to get that. You just have to go behind a castle near the Dragon Communion Church in, in Kaelid. I don't know. That, that's why this one's a little bit iffy, is because, yeah, these OP items exist, but I, I, I don't know. I mean, why would you not want to use some of the fun items in the game? Sure, you don't want to only use the quote-unquote meta or OP items, but there are items in the game that are so much more interesting, so much better than just a standard shield and a great sword. And even if you did want to play with a standard shield and a great sword, why, why aren't you just using buffs? Just use buffs! I want to end the video here on some common ground that I agree with this guy on. NPC quests, specifically, are too difficult to follow, hard to understand, or in some places, actually impossible to complete because of possible lockouts. Oh yes, also in this game we have NPC quests, and all jokes aside, how many quest lines you finished without YouTube tutorials? At least one. For example, in Dark Souls games, I on my own did Solar, Lucatiel, Sigwards, and Greyrat's quest, but in Elden Ring, yeah, not even a chance. By the way, if... And I agree with this statement in full. There isn't a single thing in this statement that I disagree with. This is 100% true. If there was a single problem in Elden Ring, it would be the quests. I love the quests. They're awesome. But you do have to use the wiki to do most of them. I found out Nefeli's my first try. I found out Gideon's my first try, but Gideon's wasn't really that hard. I found out Celevis is my first try, and actually used that on Dung Eater. I did Ronnie's quest my first try, and that was about it. Four of the NPCs. I didn't do Roger, I didn't do Dialos, I didn't do Dees, I didn't do Fias, I didn't do... Uh, who else? Who else? Jarban, I didn't do Alexander's, Blythe's. Who else? There's a lot more in the game, but that's seven off the bat that I can think of that I just couldn't figure out. I just didn't do. So I would have preferred to see something like Red Dead Redemption 2's quest system. Not entirely, though. Not where it puts like a big like golden uh, circle on your map telling you where to go like GTA. But no, I, I mean, I don't want it to litter the map just like Silver Boy's example in his video because those things are annoying to look at. But I have having nothing is not a better alternative. So, in my opinion, I think there should have been a journal option on the menu. Somewhere maybe under the status uh, section inside your, your start menu that you can just access any time where you can sit down and open it and it provides you specific tabs relating to each of the characters you've met. You can click on a tab and it will provide information on the NPC's quest that, uh, like a completion up until that point or maybe uh, maybe where to go next. So I agree, it does not feel like a fully developed quest system. It is absolutely lacking, and I agree in that regard wholeheartedly. But for the most part, a lot of these things that Silverboy claims just aren't true. So I don't think Elden Ring is just a horse simulator, even though you do spend a lot of time on your horse. And even if you do consider it a horse simulator, I don't think that takes away from the game. I think it may take away from your, your taste. I think your taste has a lot to do with your enjoyment of the game. So maybe it takes away from your enjoyment of the game, but it doesn't make the game itself worse. I don't believe it makes Elden Ring feel like it has an empty world. I don't feel like a lot of the catacombs, caves, and dungeons are very bad. I don't feel like they're lacking in content. I do agree that some key items and locations are hard to find, though some of the examples Silverboy gives are absolutely dog tier. Dectus Medallions, Glintstone Academy Key, both should be found within three minutes. I don't agree that crafting is a useless system, though I do agree that there are useless systems in the game. And I also don't fully agree that the Ashes of War are too OP. And I don't believe that a typical knight with a shield and straight sword should be the easiest option. I don't think it should be the easiest option for you to simply just jump into the game and beat every boss with the default loadout. I think you should have to work and mix up your build and use different things. So I think that will put this to an end of the video. I agreed that NPC quests are difficult to follow and hard to understand, but as for the rest, uh, some things are just a little bit iffy, if not a, pretty much untrue. So if you like this video, leave a like, leave a comment. Tell me your thoughts. Subscribe, maybe, if you want to see more Elden Ring content. If you want to see more, really, anything content. We have uh, the Shadow of the Earth Tree coming out in June. 
I'm definitely going to play that. I might upload it, maybe even stream it over the summer, if that's something you guys are interested in. Just let me know what you guys think. Anyway, uh, this has been Carson. Uh, thanks for watching this long video, and goodbye. So that's where my video would have ended, but during production, Silverboy uploaded a new video that basically served as a response to people in this comment section on the first one. This one is titled, Stop Justifying Elden Ring's Problems. And, okay, it basically just gives some amendments and some fixes to some of the points that were lacking. And so I'm not going to go over a lot of the things I said in this video. But I will give my amended, quote-unquote, versions of uh, my responses to points that he changed or points that he went more in-depth on. I'm also going to bring up one other point that um he brought up in this new video so let's get into that first the amount of all bosses from miyazaki's games is just a pure bullshit and you can defend it unless you are a brainless fanboy who will defend anything like wow this wasn't going to make it in the first draft of this video but then it got me thinking about some of the other things he said first of all it's just elden ring so relax it's a pretty good game but this meltdown here only really serves to dilute every other point you've made in both videos because Elden Ring is a good game. It's That's pretty much inarguable. It's a good game in a sea of steam slop. You are going to find that nearly the entire fan base loves it. It's a great game. But secondly, one of your problems with the first video you made was that, in your own words, no one listened to you or just ignored your points. Can you blame them? Calling your viewers brainless for wanting to defend their favorite game, or calling them sweaty tryhards for just being good at it? That's not the way to get people to care about your opinions. It doesn't work. You just sound stupid. <laughs> okay, now let's get into the- So I actually didn't have a lot to say about this in the first draft of my video, because in my opinion it was a little bit too subjective. Um, it was mostly just his opinion on the Elden Ring bosses. Basically, that the lack of unique bosses makes the game worse. And what a unique boss is, is basically any boss that you can only fight once. So like Melania in the Hallow Tree. There is no duplicate Melania. But that also excludes people like Horaloo, who is the second phase of Godfrey. Because technically you fight Godfrey before, he just gets a new skill set. Which I think is a little bit of an unfair definition of what a unique boss is, but, you know, that's not up to me. That's been there before me. Where this gets interesting is Silverboy claims that bosses that are human-like cannot be unique bosses. And I disagree with that. Because he says you have to include people like Bloody Finger Narius or any other red phantom that pops up in the game as a unique boss by this definition. But I don't because they don't have a big red health bar at the bottom. Yes, they have a health bar you can see, but they're like any other mob in the game. Gideon is not like any other mob in the game because he has an arena dedicated to himself, a big health bar at the bottom, same with Fia's champs, and boss music. I think that is more than enough to qualify him as a unique boss. And secondly, I don't agree with the fact that just because a boss isn't unique, it is bad. Look at Estelle. Estelle was included in the game twice, and both times they were fantastic. Godfrey was included in the game twice, and his fight is fantastic. So I think it's unfair to exclude bosses from the quote-unquote good category simply because they happen twice. You have bosses like Godric, whose second encounter is one, optional, and two, in an Everjail far out of the way. You have to be looking to fight Godric a second time to fight him a second time. But you also have bosses like Horaloo and Malaketh who don't count as unique bosses even though you only fight them once, simply because the first half of their boss fight is something that people have already seen before. So I don't really think that's a fair definition for unique boss. In fact, I think that the term unique boss should only exclude duplicates, not exclude bosses that have duplicates. See the difference? The difference is, that would turn a measly 8 unique boss fights to around 150, give or take. See, Elden Ring is a much larger game than its counterparts like Dark Souls 3, which only had 25 bosses total and only 19 required to beat the game. Elden Ring, by comparison, 
with that 150 non-repeat boss fights is six times more bosses than Dark Souls 3. And you expect not to find some of these being used in other locations, like at the end of a dungeon maybe, or maybe out in the open world guarding something? Like, to me, it just doesn't stand to reason that you would expect every single boss in this gigantic game to be completely different. The first time you encounter a boss, it is truly unique, period, plain and simple. Saying that a boss is bad simply because you get the opportunity to fight it more than once isn't a very sound argument in itself, especially when you have bosses like Godfrey, Horalu, and Estelle, who are both fantastic bosses, but happen more than once. But then you get to one of his main points. Gideon and Fia's champs. Gideon. In this video, I said least. And no, I won't consider Sir Gideon as boss because should I really explain why? And as it appeared, I have to explain it. Oh my god, I can't believe I have to explain it. Arches, Gideon, Vike, or Fia's champs are a fucking enemy NPCs. And if you consider them as a boss fight, then consider every single red phantom from Dark Souls 2 or from Demon's Souls as a boss fight. Especially Forlorn from Aldia's Keep. I really hope that you got what I mean this time. He argues that they're not even boss fights, which I would disagree with to begin with, but if you do include them as boss fights, sure, they're unique, but you also have to include any red phantom, such as Bloody Finger Narius, as a unique boss, and I disagree with that too. So, first of all, I don't think that Narius would count as a unique boss, because he certainly isn't, and I'll get into why. Gideon and Fia's champs are bosses because they have three things that Bloody Finger Narius don't. A boss health bar, a designated arena, and boss music. When you fight Narius or Anastasia or any other red phantom like Okina, there is none of those. You don't have a designated arena, they just invade your world. You don't have boss music, and you don't have a boss health bar. They have health bars, but not at the very bottom of your screen. So, I don't count those invaders as boss fights. But Gideon certainly is, because he has all three of those. And that's an inarguable part, because you have to beat Gideon to continue. You don't have to beat Narius. You don't have to beat Okina. You don't have to beat Anastasia. You don't have to beat any of them. You can just run away, and they'll despawn, and then you can continue. Gideon is a mandatory boss. Therefore... He should absolutely count as a unique boss. Fia's champs technically aren't necessary bosses, but they have all three of those things too. They have boss health bars, they have boss music, and they have a designated arena. I, I have nothing more to say about that. They are bosses. You have to deal with that. So pretty much there's only one more thing that I really disagree with here, and I'll just let it speak for itself. Who the fuck are you to say that I choose a bad weapons? This is a fucking RPG. I should play however I want and however I like. And who the fuck are you to say that my build is bad? I like to use straight swords. I like to play as a knight with middleweight armor while having one fast sword and a shield. Why I am supposed to change my weapons type in order to beat this game? I can understand your elemental damage change. For example, in Dark Souls 3, if your weapon had fire damage, in Demon Ruins you have to change your element damage because mobs have a I resist and I can get it. In this, I can see logic, but when a huge fucking open world forces me to use a specific weapons or specific weapon type, I just no longer can enjoy this game. In any Dark Souls games, especially in Dark Souls 2, you could build whatever you liked and took any weapon type, but in Elden Ring, if you want to do a normal damage without stupid ashes of war that are absolutely unbalanced and boring, you have to either take huge weapons, which are a pure trash, or take bleed weapons and do percent max health damage. So, first of all, I'd like to put this into a little bit of perspective for you, because, sure, it is an RPG, and you are allowed to play however you want, but you can't get mad at people for telling you that how you're playing is suboptimal, right? That's just not fair to the people that are criticizing you, because at the very end of the day, they are still just defending their favorite game, right? So, here's the thing. What do you have to do for this? This OP Ash of War damage dealer, what do you have to do for that? You have to start up the game, you have to go kill Margit, you have to go kill Godric, you have to either kill Ranala or Radon, 
you need to go to Landell, you need to kill Morgat, you need to go to the mountaintops of giants, you need to kill Fire Giant, you need to go to Crumbling Faramazula, you need to go kill the Godskin Duo, and finally you have to kill Malaketh. That is so late game that it doesn't really mean anything to me when you compare the two. You start the game, then you get a straight sword. How are those two comparable on any metric? And even then, the damage is somewhat comparable, because against Melania, a straight sword, single-handed, with a fire attunement, is doing about 400 damage per hit, right? And this is 100% totally in the bounds of your preferred playstyle. It's doing about 400 damage per hit, but he's getting about 3 hits off before Melania can even react. And even if he misses, he still gets the chance to dodge away before she can really do anything because guess what? It's a safer option, like I mentioned before. Now, here's here's my gripe with this. Three hits, 400 damage apiece, 12k damage. The Blasphemous Blade, Ash of War, only does 14k compared to that 12k. You start the game with one, you have to kill Rykard for the other. The damage is 100% comparable. If you're playing it right, you can make straight swords very viable. Better? No. Viable? Yes. Absolutely you can make them viable. Because here's here's footage of this guy using pretty much your exact same loadout, give or take the armor or the shield size or whatever, but it's pretty much just medium weight armor, a straight sword with a fire ash of war attunement, and a shield. And sure, He's not doing that much damage, but just as I said earlier, he's getting safe hits in. Even when he messes up, he's able to get out before Melania can hit him. So in conclusion, while I do agree that there shouldn't be a quote-unquote meta in this kind of RPG style game, and that there shouldn't be a definitive best loadout, I don't think that the Ashes of War are the problem. I don't think that most of them are as OP as Silverboy claims. And I don't think that a s simple straight sword and shield setup should be the best damage dealer in the entire game. It is 100% viable as of right now. And this footage really does do it some justice. Doing about 12k damage for a much safer loadout is infinitely more valuable, in my opinion, than the Rykard Blasphemous Blade Ash of War, even if it does do stance damage. Because at the end of the day, this guy's also doing this without any kind of summons. Summons are 100% allowed. If you add a Mimic tier, that's more damage that's coming out of this straight sword only gameplay. So it is 100% viable. I disagree with Silverboy on that point. And that will pretty much end off the video there. I said what I had to say. Uh, if you agree, leave a like. If you don't, leave a comment. Okay, bye.